Today, I am personally very excited about our speaker. We've had a chance to connect um, uh, and have been talking about trying to highlight the work of Project Weave uh, for some time. Because when I first learned about Project Weave, to me, it really summed up what community foundations are all about. We are about weaving and connecting and bringing people together in our communities. And I think it's a natural fit for the work that's being done at the Aspen Institute. Frederick Riley, I'm going to read uh, a brief bio, but he comes to us um, very uh, experienced and leading this charge um, actually across the country. And to have him here in St. Cloud is a real treat. Frederick Riley is the executive director of Weave, the social fabric project at the Aspen Institute. He previously served as the chief advancement officer for the YMCA of Greater Cincinnati, where he provided strategic leadership in financial development, advancing the YMCA mission through annual giving, government and foundation grants, endowment bequests, along with gifts and capital campaigns. He developed a fundraising board, positioned the Y as a dedicated community partner, and, lead advocacy, and led advocacy efforts, program impact, and volunteer development. Before joining the YMCA of Greater Cincinnati, he served as the National Director of Urban Development for YMCA of the USA, the Y's National Resource Office. There, he served as the principal thought leader and strategist for programs and services impacting over 3 million teens around the country. He also served in similar leadership roles for the YMCA of Southwest Illinois, Metro Atlanta YMCA, and the National Conference of Black Mayors. He is passionate about the development of communities and its people. He has spent almost two decades ensuring the positive life trajectory for youth with a focus on urban underserved communities and poverty. Originally from Saginaw, Michigan, college and professional opportunities allowed for stops in Atlanta, St. Louis, Chicago, and Cincinnati. He, he participated he, he participate. I'm sorry, he participates in many professional and civic groups, but none are more coveted than the role of favorite son, brother, uncle, and godfather. Please give a warm welcome to Frederick Riley. Good afternoon. Is this, is this the after lunch crowd or the sleepy now crowd? <laughs> so, so let me, so I have to, I, 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 let me start this with a disclaimer, right? <laughs> um, this is my first time speaking in a room um, with people um, in two years, right? <laughs> um, uh, my first time in two years speaking in a room with a jacket and a tie on and pants. <laughs> Um, so I'm a little discombobulated, right? This is a weird experience. Um, <laughs> um, I have ADHD, so my brain processes things differently. So sometimes I get a little jumbled up. Um, I know what I'm talking about. So if I, if I pace a little too fast, somebody just tells me to simmer down just a little bit, right? Cause I can get a little all over the place. Um, and, um, I talk fast sometimes. So tell me to pace it down just a little bit. Um, on the screen, where's the clicker? There's a clicker here. Um, on the screen, oh, oh it's here. Um, see, I told you my brain. Okay, now it's on. Oh, bam, I'll go back to that. Um, <clears throat> in 1963, Steve Udall, who was the uh, Secretary of Interior under President John Kennedy, they released a book and it was called uh, The Quiet Crisis. Um, and it was about the environment. In 1963, I wasn't around, but if you could, if anybody else was here in 1963, um, on highways, there were billboards everywhere. You saw uh, junkyards all over the place. And he was reminding the country and the nation of the swelling, quiet issue of our climate. And he goes, if we don't fix this now, we won't get to the year 2020. It's weird that we're still talking about climate right now because we didn't listen to Steve. Um, but what came out of Steve's work is now the EPA and what President Johnson coined as the Beautification Project. They coined it the Beautification Project because they wanted to make sure that they could just like slide it under. But that quiet crisis at the time has snowballed right now to a real national issue. And it's the issue of our ozone. We have, you know, for you can't say climate to some people, you have to say floods. You can't say climate to some people, you have to say fires. And so that, cr that crisis, that quiet crisis is now erupting. But right now we have another qu qu quiet crisis and it's the qu crisis of trust. 
I'm going to tell you how the quiet, the crisis of trust is going to be something that will snowball and it could road we will get worse than floods and fires here in this country. I start every talk with this particular fish, right? You're probably wondering why this has nothing to do with a fish. Um, several years ago, I was in, I'll first say, I bring everything to every conversation I have, my whole self. I believe I have to be whole and honest and true about who I am in every room that I go to. And so in the time that I'm speaking, I may say things that you disagree with or you think it's a little crazy or you go, oh, I totally disagree with that. Don't choke on those things, right? Because that'll like throw you off from the meat of the message. I was in Puerto Rico several years ago, my partner and I, and we went on what I was calling at the time a vacation right? We were vacation, vacation. We're out Puerto Rico. We go to this fancy restaurant. Now, both of us are from, um, he was from the projects of, uh, Chicago. I was from the projects of Michigan. We go to this place and they serve this big, fancy whole red fish. It had eyes in it. And I was like a little terrified, like, what is this? I've only seen catfish nuggets, right? But they put this whole fish in front of us. Um, and so the fish comes to the table and she could tell that we were both kind of bewildered by what we saw. And so she says, oh, let me tell you this. She goes, uh, the fish, um, Babe, eat the meat, but be careful of the bones. The bones will choke you and the meat will make you big and strong. So today, be careful of the bones. The bones are the things you may think are a little weird and a little hokey. You may not agree with. Spit those out. Don't focus on those. Focus on the meat and the meat is the part that will nourish you, okay? Because there's something you can learn in every lesson. But if you get choked on the bones, you won't. Uh, this kid here, right? Like, I don't know how this kid becomes this person, right? I grew up in Saginaw, Michigan. Statistically, I'm not supposed to be in a room like this, having this conversation. I'm one of six. I'm a twin brother. Um, I didn't meet my dad until I was 12 years old. Um, we grew up in mostly abject poverty most of my life. Um, and statistics say that I'm not qualified because of birthright. Because, you know, I watch a lot of stuff about the crown and all this stuff. And so birthright gives you a lot of entry into things, right? But by sheer luck of my birth, I shouldn't be here because of how I was raised. But my life was weaved together by people, right? My first grade teacher, Ms. Helfred, who was the first person to tell me I was smart. Or my third grade teacher, Mr. Galloway, who was the first person to tell me that I could achieve big things. Or my fifth grade teacher, Ms. Smith, who also became my sixth grade teacher, who told me I was brilliant and she wanted to become a sixth grade teacher because she loved me so much in the fifth grade. And then my high school English teacher, Ms. Sharon Floyd, who would send me gifts when I was in college and checks to make sure that I was navigating the journey. They helped to stitch together my life. And so me heading to weave was this thing of how do I go back and highlight those people, the Sharon Floyds, the Ms. Helfreds, um, the Mr. Galloways, the Mrs. Smiths, the people who helped me stitch together my life. All of us are here because people are weaving together. And right now in communities all around where you hail from, there are people who are weaving together. And our role is to highlight these people so that most other people can feel like they have a role in that as well. Um, I was going to go through a little bit of my career journey, but Steve went through it already. Um, it's a bunch of fluff, um, uh, nothing of substance until I got to weave. It's probably some of the most important work that, that I'll do. Um, but I'm going to start and ask you all a question. Now. Who do you trust? Somebody just raise their hand and scream it out. Who do you trust? Come on. I'm gonna start calling on people. Who do you, who do you trust? Your mother. Who do you, who's anybody else trust? Your husband? Your wife? Who else? Your good friend, Angela? You know, so so research is like pretty adamant. Like they started asking this question in the 1950s. Who do you trust? Um, they started asking this question of trust in the 1950s. And what it is, has morphed into is it's the largest, best data on quality of life. You can test and see where we are in the climate of our country based on whether or not people trust or not. It sounds weird. It sounds a bit hokey, but it's true. Trust is in everything that we do. And there's still no rhyme or reason why people trust and why they don't. I can get why you trust your mother. I could get why you trust your husband and your best friend because you all have spent time together. Um, you have very similar views. You've grown up together and you have cemented a what? A relationship. You all know each other very well. Trust is built on relationships and times and how closely connected you are. And, but as a society, we are becoming less and less and less connected in one another, especially this thing called social trust. Social trust is the belief in honesty, integrity, and a reliability in others. It's a true faith in people. How many of you trust people? Be honest. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to go through some stats in a minute. What you're saying is not true. You do not trust people. You don't. You don't. <laughs> you're not telling the truth here. How many of you all trust people? Like, honestly, less hands went up this time. I appreciate the honesty. 
So I did this thing, right? Why, why should we care about this? So I did a study over a couple of weeks and everywhere I went, I wanted to go back and find the mission statement. I wanted to find their promise. I wanted to find what they were saying to their customers or whatever it was. I went to the dry cleaners. I went to the grocery store. I go a lot of places. Um, I went to, I rode the train in DC. Um, that's a gym. That's a car dealership. That looks like a restaurant. Um, that's American Express that I'm sometimes late on. That's, um, I was flying somewhere. That's somebody running for a mayor's office in DC, a bank. Um, that I'm buying a place. And so we're having some folks work on the, um, the, con contr the contractors. I don't know what that is from so far. That's the airport. Um, all of these things. At the core of all of these things, you know what they had in their message? Trust me. Do you trust them? What happens if you don't trust them? Do you do any of those things if you trust them? Listen, I do well with amens, hallelujahs. Um, so so <laughs> you got to give me something back. Uh, so, <laughs> so listen, trust is at the core of everything we do in life. Is it, the, is it the core of your relationships at home? Is it the core of the relationships you have in your neighborhoods, at work, and everything we use in today's society? And if trust erodes, imagine what happens to society as a whole. See, that's what I'm talking about. See, I, somebody, see, I appreciate that. When trust is broken, right? When tr when they begin to trust, when they test trust numbers here in this country, they also begin to look at things like crime. Crime goes up in our country when trust is low. And it goes up because people refuse to follow laws when they don't trust the people who are enforcing them. Do we see a spike in crime right now in our country? We see it everywhere. When trust... When trust goes down, we see people not voting or we see what we saw January 6th at the U.S. Capitol. Our democracy is at play when there is no trust. When trust goes away, people don't invest money in the financial markets. My grandfather lived in rural Mississippi and he'd always say, Freedom Bank, Free Freedman's Bank stole all our money. And when he died, he had all this money in a suitcase under his bed because he didn't trust the banks. But there are a lot of people right now who don't trust financial markets right now. And so they're holding on to their money. Uh, I, the, Mr. President, I'm not sure if you're seeing an, uh, pe people running in, opening up bank accounts right now, but I'm almost certain when, when the market has a hit, it has something to do with trust. Um, life happiness and life expectancy index goes off the chart. People die faster when they don't trust and they are less happy when they don't trust. People talk about things like loneliness. Um, I don't trust my neighbors. Um, suicide increases when there's no trust in society. And then the last one, and I've read this, I've read these playbooks that dictators play through, right? And one of the things in the dictator's playbook in the middle of it is how do you erode trust? How do you get neighbors fighting against each other? How do you get people who look like each other, but maybe of different religions fighting against each other? How do you get people of different political affiliations who look alike, live next door to each other to hate each other? That's at the core of it. it ha that's what wo it's World War II started with, people fighting all, all because of some difference. And so... We have to really be careful because when trust erodes, we are going to get rid of um, our modern day society. Hold on. So what's the data telling us? So if you look at these are, I'm not sure if you can see that very well, but at the top of that, that chart, that's 1960. And over on the end, it's 20, 2010. Um, and that's the start of, when they started testing trust in government. And so do you see how high we trend up in 1960 and you see how far down we go now? And you see the zigzags. You can imagine what was happening um, during that time. I think like if you look, Nixon was the president at some point in there um, and then it goes down, comes back up in like 2000, but goes down. So people right now are saying, um, I don't trust our American government. 75%, like I asked earlier, do you trust, right? 75% of Americans say um, that, they, that their trusts in our American government is shrinking. 63% of them say that they have no confidence in elected officials. 63, do 63% of people vote for somebody that they don't have any confidence in? 41% um, believe that the trust is causing problems. I wanna go back to the 63%, right? Do we have a democracy of 63% of people don't vote in an election? You know, we have major cities right now with millions of peoples and the election is being called by 100,000 people. That's no trust. And then when there are things, when over half of the of American people say that people, I asked earlier, 
when you when I said, can people be trusted? And everybody raised their hand. And over half of Americans right now say people can't be trusted. One half. Over one half believe that people will take advantage of them if they have their chance. Do you believe that? I do. I lock my doors when I go places. I believe that my neighbors will steal from me if I'm not around. I do. I don't trust. I don't know these people. I don't trust them. 63% believe that most people will look out for themselves versus looking out for other people. I don't believe that of you in the room because you work for a community foundation, but most people believe that 63% of people will look out for themselves and not each other. So when trust goes down, trust, it can be like a snowball coming down, a, um, down the side of a mountain really fast. It's going to like blow up and snowball effect. If you live in a place where trust is eroding, it's probably a really tough place to live. Imagine for a, for a second living in a place where trust is eroding. What, what do you see in the neighborhood? Well, you probably see it because you are living in a place where trust is eroding. So with all the, um, the bad things, to, but to get trust back up, it's almost like a, a slow creep up a hill, but it can happen if you think about being in a bad marriage or a bad relationship um, that's going south, being trapped in a home with somebody you don't trust. How do you, how do you heal that, right? So there's steps you can do. You can go talk to a therapist or a counselor, some things you can work on, um, and you can and you can build trust. And so they say that there's some things that you can do to repair trust. And so they say it starts with um, institutions and results for people. And so right now, people are view the federal government as having results for uh, rich people and not real people who live on Main Street. And so how do we change the government so that the results are really for the people? And then a shift in leadership. I was having a conversation earlier about youth development. How do we work with youth right now so when they become the leaders of tomorrow that they are working for the greater good of humanity and not just themselves? We have to talk about how we tra are training our young people. It has to be Madam Super, former superintendent. We were, Cindy, we were talking about her role as superintendent. We have to talk beyond just math and reading. Like the, the society has changed and we have to talk about leadership development as well. And then there's, yeah, amen. See, there we go. And then there are things like transparency. Um, how do you, what's in the budget? What's really happening? What's this for? How do you get rid of the pork? How do we really be honest with people about what these institutions are doing? And then one of them, which is at the heart of what I get to do at Weave is local people solving issues together, connected communities and relationships in connected communities. That is how you increase trust. Everybody, when I said, who do you trust? Everybody named somebody that they were connected to. Nobody said, I trust my neighbor. Nobody said, I trust the person who I volunteer with. Nobody said, I trust the person that lives three blocks over that I serve on the homeowners association with. Because I don't think we think about those as trusted relationships, but they are. I want you to think about people that you volunteer with. You might not even talk to them about who they voted for, but you do talk to them about the issues that you're working on together. The people who you are building planting flowers with, you don't talk to them about what are their views on abortion, but you do talk to them about the flowers that you're going to plant there. And so I think we have to center the relationships on the things that we hold in common and not the thing that things that we see different. And in spite, uh, this might say amen. Um, <laughs> in spite of all the crazy things that we hear that are happening in society, what we like to highlight is there are still these really great people doing amazing things in communities for gratis. First person is Aisha Butler in Chicago. I got a chance to meet with Aisha when I first started with Weave in Chicago in the Inglewood neighborhood. She lived in, has anybody ever been in Chicago? And you go to a neighborhood in Chicago has a house, three vacant lots, a house, vacant lot, four vacant lots, a house. And so it's all burned up, dilapidated. And so she lived in this neighborhood and she looked out the window one day, she and her husband was going to going to close on a place in the suburbs. And she saw some little girls going to school and they started throwing rocks at each other in this vacant lot. And she goes, we should really do something about this. Who should we call about this? And her husband goes, uh, you, you want to move out to the suburbs. You can stay here if you want to. And so they said, okay, forget it. We're going to stay here. And so they started, she, what she started to do was petition the city to sell them the lots for pennies on the dollars so that they could build parks homework stations, places for people to have barbecues, cookouts. They wanted to turn and revolutionize the neighborhood. They went to the city. She went to the city and they said, no. So then she went and got two neighbors. She got four more neighbors. And the city says, okay, yeah, we'll do it. We'll give them to you. So now when you go to her neighborhood in Inglewood, you see these parks, you see recreation stations, you see kids doing homework, all because she stood up and said, I'm the one. She's a trusted person in her community. And because of her selfless act, she's raised the housing prices. The crime is down in the neighborhood. And she doesn't have this big nonprofit organization. She's doing it all at the back of her house. And then people, folks like Mac McCarter in Shreveport, Louisiana, who moved back home to Shreveport. He was a pastor for years and said, 
we have all this regentrification coming along. You have this neighborhood that stops here. and This neighborhood starts here. Everybody's afraid of each other. Nobody talks to each other. How do we come in this community and lead with love? How do I walk down the street and grab this person who you think is a gang member and grab this person who you think is this and bring them together and let's get to know each other so that the neighborhood can grow. And from that selfless act, Mac has erected this huge organization and he's going around and he's helping to model for cities all around the country how to integrate or re Inter reintegrate neighborhoods that are now what they call on the seams. People from one neighborhood moving to another rate. It's so it's like miraculous work. And then one of my personal favorites is Shorty. Shorty lost his son to gang violence in Baltimore and um, was kind of a wreck and couldn't figure out what to do. He felt like nobody would talk to him. He felt like he had no place to get grief counseling. And he's like, I don't know where I can get help for what I'm going through, but what society is having as a whole. So he owned a barbecue restaurant. So he started putting a barbecue truck on the back of his truck, a barbecue grill on the back of his truck, uh, grilling ribs, macaroni and cheese and beans, tables and chairs. And he'd pull up in a neighborhood and invite everybody from around the city to a barbecue. But there was one caveat. You have to sit at a table with somebody you didn't know. And he'd say, here's the conversation, start, have a conversation. And I've gone to one of these. And there are people from all walks of life that you could never imagine are just sitting around talking and having conversations. And it is the strangest thing, but it shouldn't be. It is real people getting closely connected. And that is where you build trust. You have people walk away from that place with jobs. You have people who walk away from that place with funding for projects. You have people walk away from that with new volunteers, but all because they took the first step and started relationships. Weave was started because of that. When David started Weave, David Brooks, who started Weave, the Social Fabric Project at the Aspen Institute in 2018, it was because David was at a uh, breaking point in his life. He um, got a divorce. He was living between two or three cities, writing columns for all these different places and said, but there had to be more to life. I needed to do more than what I could, what I was doing every single day. And so he got invited to a uh, a home in D.C. for this family who was hosting Thursday night dinners for kids who needed help. Their kids would just bring kids home from school. The parents were well connected and they would figure out how to help the kids. And so at one of the uh, dinners, they had the Secretary of Health and Human Services. This family was really connected. So they had, knew some really big people. So the Secretary of HUD, Health and Human Services was there and a young lady needed to get on the liver transplant list but had Medicaid. And so at the table, the secretary called the person who could manage, who manages that. They got the young lady on a list. And a week later, this young lady was getting prepped for surgery to get a new kidney. And so Davis says, I wonder, are there people who are doing stuff like this all around the country? So he hired some researchers. I work for the Aspen Institute. We're a big heady place. So we hired these researchers to call cities all around the country to say, who shows up for your community? And I want you to know, nobody said the mayor, which there, if there's some mayors in here, I'm pretty sure you show up for the city. Nobody said the superintendent, but I'm almost certain superintendents show up for cities. But they said really non-suspecting people. They said people like bank presidents, or they said people like the butcher or barber or this person or that person. This lady down the street serves food out of her back door at the end of the day. This person right here has a book drive that she does every year and is teaching kids to, re to read. And so it's like there has to be something to that. And then we started going around the country and meeting these people. And we realized that we had to just stop highlighting who they were, but we had to begin to connect them. We had to invest in them because that's the only way we're going to create this nation swell of weavers around the country or for folks to be able to recognize that there were other folks just like them. And so what we find is there are people in every city around the country who are doing this big miraculous work for gratis. And so our role at Weave is to support them in their work so that they can do it bigger and better. And so our strategic priorities are to connect weavers with each other, inspire new generations of weavers, because I don't have time to unpack this, uh, the stats on young people in college right now. And if you really want a special project, we should be really focused on them because that's a Gen Z is a Gen, well, they say it about every generation, but Gen Z right now, the stats don't really lie about the support they need right now. And then to lift weavers up as the drivers of community change, which you already know. Our ultimate goal is to grow relationships and social trust, narratives, um, we want to change systems because we want to make sure that funding can go to these local groups, these non-suspecting groups, and then that we can shift uh, the power and the agenda so that the folks who are doing this work deeply, hyper-locally in community are helping to set the, the, the agenda for what's the folks at the Nebraska Foundation, at the, you already know what you're doing. That, this is, this is, that is center stage. Like, how does the community set the agenda? Our challenge is that social trust is at an all-time low. How do we get people who are... But these folks who are doing the work in local communities aren't really like the appreciated people, but our mission is to strengthen them. And our vision is that we have a, a, a world full of them um, and where trust is like bustling all around the country because it's at the core. 
So what do we do? We listen to weavers. We corralled a couple hundred weavers over a course of three months and just asked a ton of questions through a big research project. We wanted to know why did they start, why did they become a weaver? Um, what are the unique challenges they're faced with? And how can we begin to bucket them up into what, why they're weaving? And so we came up with these descriptors. Um, but what we've realized is that there are some people who come to weave through some great triumph in life. Um, I've been a columnist for 20 years and now I want to get back to society. Yay, you're a weaver. But then we have some folks who, through some great tragedy, there's a mother in Youngstown, Ohio, who husband killed himself, but killed the kids before committing suicide. And she paid a asthmat team to come in and uh, disinfect her house. Um, but she realized that there are mothers on the other side of the neighborhood who were just cutting the holes out of their carpet um, and going on with life. And she goes, that's wrong. So she started a fund to be able to fund, to have the homes cleaned of people who experience violence. And so she just started weaving based on a personal tragedy. But then there's another group of people who, what Beyonce say, I woke up like this, who just woke up one day or grew up and decided that they wanted to give back to society. So how do we support all three groups of these different people? And then um, we wanted to learn from them because we're going to teach their skills to people who come to us every day and say, I want to become a weaver. Um, we have just launched a national search for an advisory board because we want to make sure I work in a fancy office in downtown DC um, and I have no relevancy in communities around the country. And so our work should be driven by the people who are working in local communities. And so they will advise our work and we'll pay, we'll pay them for that because I think sometimes as well, we, we want communities to do work, but don't pay them for it because we see everything as a volunteer opportunity, which I think is important, but I think it's also important to pay them like you would pay a, a consultant as well. Um, and we're building out trainings and tools for the people who are doing the work around the country. We've also launched what I have been told I can't say anymore is the Facebook for weavers. Um, so we, have, we have an online community where I think we have like 5,000 people connected online right now, where we're connecting folks in Nebraska and Albuquerque, folks in Albuquerque and Chicago, Chicago and DC, because what we recognize is there's some shared benefits to people who are in the struggle together to talk and work together and me not have to be involved in it. And so we're connecting weavers all around the country to have exchanges because what they don't want to do is to talk on these big platforms because they see all the toxicity. And so we create a, a space for them to come together, talk their learnings. We have these, I work for Aspen, so we do a lot of seminar-like conversations and, and some platforms, but it's a really good space that's actually ballooning. We are actually, actually funding. So we've figured out how to work with big groups who want to get deeply involved in the community. Our first pilot was in Baltimore where we gave $5,000 uh, gifts to 10 groups. We're doing the same thing again this year. We're going to do 25 groups. Um, and these are folks who typically wouldn't qualify for an, a, a grant at a foundation because they don't have a 501c3. They're small, one shoestring budget. And we're helping them to kind of expound on their idea, teach them how to budget for it, and then go in and check with them throughout the process. But it's more than just giving them money. What we've done is also to be able to connect the community together. So the first awardees, four of them in the first session together, how often have you ever been in a room with grantees who are all being funded together? It never really happens, right? And we said to them, you all could do bigger work if you decided to pool your money together. And so the first four of them said right out the door, we want to pool our money together to do this, right? And so imagine what happened with that. And then what we also found was that there are support systems in a community that don't always talk to one another. And what we started bringing them to the table. So it's all about, so what we've decided is that we have to do this in a cohort because we want them to grow their work together. We want them to work together, but we want them to solve community issues together. We are, we launched, we're in a beta test mode for a local neighborhood trust index. First time anybody's ever done this, where we're laying big data on top of each other from zip code to zip code so that you can go in and say, I want to know where trust is in the walking score of my neighborhood. You'll type in your zip code. It'll give you an infographic. It'll tell you where trust is. It'll tell you what you can do, the projects you can begin to work on. And then as we begin to collect more weavers around the country in those zip codes, they'll be added to the map and it could raise the score of your community, but also show what's really happening in your neighborhood with these really cool community service. I'm really cool. I'm really excited about that. It was one of my midnight hour ideas that I woke up and it's like, oh, we could actually do this. We, we're launching a speakers bureau on college campuses around the country where we're taking younger weavers um, to really inspire this generation of young people in college about their role in stepping back and giving, um, giving back to communities right now before they jump into the world of work. Um, and we're launching a grassroots campaign. So, uh, Cindy, you have a Facebook profile. I'm going to find every Cindy with a like profile and I'm going to send them an ad and I'm going to prompt them to sign up to become a weaver 
register your project and then also join our online community because I want to grow to a number of 10 million because there's something in numbers. And if you align and say you are something, it's going to make you do more. So we're launching a grassroots campaign to grow our network as well. And here's my charge to community foundations, right? And I didn't even think I was going to get that close. I'm at one minute. Oh, no. Um, so, so my charge to community foundations is you all are a funder. Um, and I know you all have some pretty tight lines in how you can fund. Right. We have to fund this type of group. They have to be a 501c3. But I think there's some people who who can be at the seams that you could find a way to fund some really cool work. So how do you reimagine how you fund people who are doing work hyper locally? Because these folks, let me tell you, I worked for a really big organization and we would get a lot of money um, and a lot of the money would go to for administrative overhead. You don't get administrative overhead with these groups. What you get is really cool work that goes back into the community. You can also begin to connect, amen. You can begin to connect these groups together because there's power in them working together. And you can see the connecting points for them to work together as groups to move big issues. And then how do you begin to amplify the stories of what's happening in your community in these cool projects, right? People listen to you and well, they have to listen to you because you have money. And so they want the money. So they're going to have to listen to you. And so it's a good platform for you to amplify the story of not just these big organizations that are doing work, but these small projects that are meeting the needs of people. And then... I always talk about the process, right? So our process for getting for giving away funds, there's four questions. Two of them are checkbox and the other two are only two paragraphs. And then somebody else has to recommend you because we recognize that if you're doing work hyper locally and it's just you, um, that do you have the time to fit out all of this stuff, right? I have a grant writer on my team who has time to write 20 pages. Most of these folks don't. And so I was going to play a video, but I don't have time. Um, but I want to, before I go, I want to do this, right? Um, and I have these. And so hopefully I can get a chance to meet everybody before I go. So I have a, a really cool pen and it's our weaver pen. And I want you to think about what weaving, what it entails to weave, right? Weaving is um, all these different strands of fabric or yarn or thread coming together to make one thing, right? And I think what we're making is a community, which leads to trust, a connected community. And so um, I wear a pen. I didn't wear it today because I wanted a little showmanship and put this on before I left. But um, I'm a weaver and I am connecting communities around the country. Um, well, I hope that's what I'm doing. Um, and you're connecting your community. So I have a pen for you and I'd like for you to wear the pen wherever you go and whenever you can and tell the story of how more connected communities is going to build trust and how it ultimately is going to snowball into a better nation. Thank you for your time. So single year, um, we do ask questions about sustainability. And what I'll tell you is if we're really elementary with this right now because we don't have a, we're learning. A, so a large bank, m and Bank is funding the, the, the expansion of this project. Um, and so we're talking about what does sustainability look like, but also recognizing that a lot of this work is young and these folks aren't really looking for sustainability. They're looking to like meet a need right now. Um, but what we have found is through the amplification of the work that they're doing, that they are raising two and three times that amount from other groups in the city who just are latching on and then connecting them with the support systems inside of the Baltimore that are, that are helping them strategic plan and then figure out their case study and all this other stuff will ultimately lead to um, sustaining the work. But I think I think sustainability. So let me let me tell you the one thing I think. I, so I used to I use those fancy words because I worked for a big organization. But I think when you think about folks who are working locally in communities, they don't even use words like sustainability. They just want to like feed people or they just want to find a space for kids. And I think, so I think I would rethink what sustainability looks like if, if I was, if I was doing this in a local place, just because I think it's important that you give some room to like let stuff get big or fail or grow and let people make some learnings. But I think sustainability is something that is overused. And I don't think it actually, some, I think, it, let me tell you this. I think it causes people to lie. And I'll tell you why. I worked for a big organization and raised a lot of money and I've counted kids four and five times. I'm just going to be honest with you. And I've told the people, no, 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 give me those numbers this way because I need to tell the funder what happened. And so I believe if we're really going to meet the need but also start these trusting relationships, we got to leave the room for people to be completely honest with us about what happened or where it's going, or I just didn't do it. And I don't think that sometimes the fundraising community allows that because we want the big shiny thing. So, yes, sir. Yes, yep, I would agree. Yes. Yeah, 
so we are what we're I, I like to call it forced family fun. And so there's an agenda. <laughs> we call them these circle conversations. And they're just a place when we start out to talk about what's happening in their neck. Because Baltimore is like a lot of other cities where people are siloed by their neighborhoods. And so they sit around the circle and talk about the work that they're doing, but more importantly, their neighborhood and what they want to do. And just in the first conversation, they realize that they're working on the same issues. They're the same type of actors, the same type of players. And then boom, we go, well, why don't you consider working with this group? Or why don't you consider doing this? And it all kind of happens by osmosis. So we don't force it, but we just force the relationships between the cohort. There was somebody else who had a question. Good. You obviously are an optimist. Uh, seems genuine. I'll, I'll trust you for a moment. For a moment. Just a, just a moment. There is a lot of stuff out there in our society. Let's just take just the United States. So yeah. Not worry about the rest of the world. Uh, do we have a chance? I think we do. Let me tell you why. I think, and I, I'm not going to talk about politics, but I'm going to just name ish pol political issues. There are probably about three or four big political issues that divide us as a nation. That's all. Research is really succinct about that. But I think the biggest thing that are dividing us now is that we're taking those issues and it causes me to not see you as human anymore. And so I think the real work is not the work of bridging conversations on differences, but the real conversations is bridging the conversation on the commonalities. They did this PBS uh, special where they, uh, they profiled Weave in the project, um, and they showed these one political supporter and another, and they were talking about their ideologies. And on the other screen, on the green, on the other side of the room, the other person was going, this person is crazy. Why is she so crazy? She's stupid. And then they both told a similar personal story to losing a mother with ovarian cancer and watching their mother die, right? And I'm on the other side of the room and I'm crying for your experience, your human experience, your mother, and you're listening to my story and you're doing the same thing. And then immediately when we came in contact with each other, you know what we were at that time? Human. And we were friends because we get to see each other as humans. So I think it's time to really bring our, our communities into conversations about the commonalities of humanism that we have and not these big four political issues that separate us. I think if we can get there, I do think we have a, ch a chance. Do you still trust me now? I do. <laughs>